Recently, Secretary of State Antony Blinken visited with China's Xi Jinping in Beijing. It was a brief 35-minute meeting, but many felt it was a step towards diplomacy. That was before Biden called Xi a dictator yesterday. One step forward, 10 steps back, you know. <laughs> well, 35 minutes is definitely short, but Blinken was there to meet with his Chinese equivalent, whom he met with for seven hours. And after his meeting, he reiterated the U.S.'s commitment to the One China policy. Watch this. On Taiwan, I reiterated the longstanding U.S. One China policy. Uh, that policy has not changed. It's guided by the Taiwan Relations Act, the three joint communiques, the six assurances. We do not support Taiwan independence. We remain opposed to any unilateral changes to the status quo by either side. We continue to expect the peaceful resolution of cross-strait differences. Well, this has some people confused. Others are angry. Some want to see the U.S. take a more aggressive stance against China and do, and do to them what essentially we're doing to Russia and Ukraine if they dare invade. With us now is political commentator and anti-imperialist rapper, Shang Yu. Shang Yu is Taiwanese and is currently in Taiwan doing his conscripted mandatory service. Shang Yu, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much for having me on. First of all, let's talk about um, this conscripted service that you're doing. You, you were, you're Taiwanese, but you were raised in the United States. And so uh, you're yes, back there correct. because you, so you have to do the, everybody has to do conscripted service in Taiwan. Yes. And so that, that's what you're there to do. Yes. Um, is, is this military service? Is that what everybody is required? Well, originally it was a military service for everyone, but starting in 2000, they introduced something called substitute service, which is um, basically um, where store brands, civil, civil, um, civil servants. And in, in I think 2018, they decided that everyone born in 1993 and before who has to do one year service because those born um, in 1994 up until 2005 only do four months. Anyways, people 1993 and before are, are just now automatically put into substitute service. So I am not military, but it's still I'm still fulfilling my duty to, um, you know, serve my one year. Right. OK, so you're there. So you're doing one year uh, of yes. service. Interesting. OK, so. Um, Really interested to get your perspective on this uh, about uh, really the sentiment of the people in Taiwan when it comes to the the policies with China. Um, what is the sentiment now with regarding all of this with with, let's say, Antony Blinken saying we're still upholding the one China policy? What are the people in Taiwan thinking about that? I think it might come as a surprise to people in America that the U.S. is upholding the one China policy, but it's been the basis for the U.S. establishing um, diplomatic ties with um, Beijing. Even even before um, the U.S. severed ties with the Taipei um, regime, the U.S. never recognized Taiwan as an independent country, but rather as before they recognized the so-called Republic of China as the legitimate government of all of China and that Taiwan was simply a part of that. So nothing's really changed. Of course, um, the people in Taiwan right now are increasingly are becoming increasingly um, impatient with and fed up with the um, incumbent party, the ruling party, the Democratic Progressive Party. And um, people want to see changes because our livelihoods are not really um, improving. And people intuitively know that becoming cannon fodder for the interests of U.S. foreign policy is not a is not a good deal for us. Right. Yeah, I'm curious. That being said, how sorry. Uh, well, I'm just curious about the war in Ukraine and how that's played on, I guess, the psychology of the of the people in Taiwan. I mean, are you guys looking at what's going on with Ukraine, the proxy war between the United States and Russia, and thinking, oh boy, we're next? You ask um, a lot of people the same question, and you're going to get different answers depending on you know their their views. But more and more people are kind of coming to the realization, even if it's um a reluctant on um, coming to this um realization that. The U.S. is not necessarily going to come and help us if a war is provoked. It'll there's a great possibility that it'll hang us out to dry, like it's doing with the Ukrainian people after you know using them to provoke a war with Russia. Right. Yeah. Do you think that people in Taiwan are ready? I mean, there you are doing conscripted mandatory service. They, as you mentioned, they increased it from four months to one year, um, and that was done fairly recently. That increase. And that would signal to me that it's because the island is preparing for war. If they're saying to kids, you know, you've got to do instead of four months, you need one year of military service. 
that seems to me that there that there is a preparation for battle. So do you think that the Taiwanese people are prepared for that? We actually had a presidential candidate, Vivek Ramaswamy, on this show. And one of his ideas for Taiwan was to give every resident an, in Taiwan a gun. He was saying, get the NRA going in Taiwan, give everybody in Taiwan a gun, and then watch, see if China chooses to invade. Um, I mean, what, what is your thought on that? Do you think the Taiwanese people are ready to take up arms and start shooting at Chinese people that maybe invade the island? I do not think um, people here are seeking war or want that situation to happen. And um, interestingly enough, um, you know, substitute service, we are not military, but we do go through a two week um, kind of basic training camp at a military base. That's some, you know, run by the people in the military. And um, when we were doing our, um, we were practicing how to shoot guns, you know, some of the soldiers would just talk to us. And one of them told them, one of the people I was there with that, yeah, he's just trying to finish his time. When you sign up for the military here as a volunteer soldier, not a conscript, it's four years. He just wants the four years to be over and just get out. They're, they're in it for um, the iron rice bowl, for lack of a better term. Whereas, um, so morale is, morale over here is not high because um, the military here is mostly made up of conscripts who look at it as some sort of, almost like a prison sentence. You know, you go in, you just want to get it over with. Whereas on the mainland, um, yeah, you, you you sign up to join the People's Liberation Army and you might not even get in because the line's that long, the wait list is oh, that wow. long. Yeah, so it's, that says a lot about the morale and most people yeah, that intuitively know that if a war were to break out, um, things will not look good. And um, the the whole thing about everyone having a gun, it reminds me of, you know, how you read articles from The Economist or whatever saying, well, a war between the mainland and Taiwan would involve an amphibious assault and amphibious assaults are very difficult. But this is what people don't seem to understand is that should, God forbid, military um, tensions, you know, break out between the two sides, Amphibious assault or, you know, boots on the ground would be the very final chapter. The first 20 right. chapters would be very strategic bombings of, you know, like um, runways and infrastructure that would completely paralyze the military capacity of the island. I mean, even right. according to um, military analysts, um, you know, that were um, with the Rand Corporation, I believe, don't have a very positive assessment of Taiwan's ability to defend itself from an attack by the People's Liberation Army. It would be more like I mean, the blockade. I mean, right. I, I've said the same thing. I don't know if there would need to be an actual invasion with boots on the ground in Taiwan. Uh, China would just need to surround the island, blockade, and prevent any sort of uh, goods and, and, like you said, transport going to and from the island. And then just making the island completely dependent on China, essentially saying, we've got you surrounded, and now you just have to deal with us and only us. You're not going to get any help from any of these outside areas. That's that's what I've always envisioned. Um, invasion is usually, you know, you're trying to get, uh, w what would be the point of an invasion to me is kind of an odd, an odd thought. Like, are you wanting to fill the island with Chinese people who speak Chinese? Well, it already is Chinese filled with food? Chinese right. people. Right, I know. That's why, that's why I yeah. don't understand what the, what the point of that would be. You know, it's, it's, there's one thing when you invade areas in order to take the land, you're wanting to fill it with your people. You're wanting to take over, uh, you know, all the infrastructure and build, uh, you, know, you kind of colonize the area. But that's already been done in Taiwan. It is filled with Chinese people speaking Chinese, eating Chinese food. So it would be no yes. there. You know, that's it's kind of an odd thought. Um, let's get back to the let's go to the history of this, because I think a lot of people don't really fully understand why there is this battle between China and Taiwan. And I'm curious, you know, maybe you can kind of, I know you know a lot about this subject, so walk us through the history of this and then where we're at today, because I think the sentiment, I'm interested to know if the sentiment of the people in Taiwan has shifted over the years as generations have gone on. So let's start with why China even feels like Taiwan is theirs. Well, um, Taiwan has been a part of China for um, many centuries, and it became a province in um, the 1880s, and it used to be a part of Fujian province. Now, in 1895, um, China lost the Sino-Japanese War, the first Sino-Japanese War, and um, it had to um, cede some territories to Japan, which was um, Taiwan. 
Now, um, in 1945, upon Japan's defeat, Japan had to surrender all of its lands that it gained illegally through um, unequal treaties, with Taiwan being one of the major ones. It also had to give up Korea and let Korea become independent. So under international law, Taiwan was returned to China in 1945. It just so happened that there was a civil war going on. And um, basically, the remnants of the old regime fled to Taiwan. And you see this a lot in um, whenever a new um, dynasty or a new government arises in China, like when the um, when the Ming overthrew the, um, the Mongol Yuan dynasty, you know, the, the northern Yuan became a, a rump state in what's now, um, you know, the Mongolia area and parts of Russia. And it considered itself, you know, to still hold on to the mandate of heaven. So this is a very similar situation, but it's also complicated by the fact that um, when the KMT, the Kuomintang, um, Chiang Kai-shek's um, party came to Taiwan, it kind of governed Taiwan as a bunch of out-of-touch elites from the mainland and in the, in the highest levels of power were dominated by people who were just recent arrivals from the mainland. And so Taiwan separatism really began as a, um, a liberal opposition to the KMT. So, I mean, yeah, legally. So basically, so the, so basically the government that was being overthrown Many of the members of those of that government went over to the island and said, OK, this is ours now. Like, you don't get it back. This is ours and we're going to set up. And from my understanding, they were there originally to kind of regroup and then hopefully go back to the mainland and continue fighting yes. for the, in the Civil War. Yes. And yes. ultimately realized that that was not a tenable idea. And so they just resolved themselves with, well, we're on an island. <laughs> and so we're going to, so the island's ours and uh, they can have the mainland and we're, we're going to have the island and run the island as an independent nation. And that's, that's kind of how that, that happened. And then of course the mainland uh, disputed that and said, no, this is a civil war you lost. You have to give us back that land. Is that, is that not right? Not necessarily. It's kind of, but not really. The mainland's more like, okay, um, you know, it's like whenever a new dynasty in China arises, let's say the Qing dynasty. I mean, when the Qing Dynasty was established, even before its formal establishment, it already had controls of um, control of the northeast of China and and parts of China. It's, when a new government or dynasty is declared, what it basically means is we might not have all of the land right now, but um, the tide's not turning back, and we're go it's eventually it's an eventuality. I mean, when the when the People's Republic of China was established in 1949, there were still many parts of um. The Chinese mainland, like the Southwest, like Sichuan, Guizhou, like you know Tibet, that were not under its control. That didn't stop it. That doesn't stop us from recognizing um, 1949, um, you know October 1st, 1949, as the beginning, as the establishment of the People's Government on the mainland. So, um, regarding regarding the Taiwan thing, well, I think um, well for a while there was this sort of resolve to recapture the mainland. But then it, eventually it became apparent that it wasn't going to happen. But even until the 2000s, most people favored maintaining the status quo for now and eventually working towards reunification. It wasn't until more recent times that um, ideas of separatism became more mainstream. You have to remember, even in the 1980s, being um, expressing pro-separatist views could land you in jail in Taiwan. Interesting. So having that, that you wanted to be fully independent from the mainland could land you in jail in the 80s. So yes. tell us what, what, what is the status quo and what would reunification, so if the, if the idea was we're gonna maintain the status quo with eventual reunification, what was the idea of how ev of eventual reunification, what would that even, how would that happen? Um, so if you could tell us first, what is, what is the status quo right now? Okay, so the status quo is this, even though separatists might say Taiwan is an independent country, the fact of the matter is that cross strait issues, meaning issues between Taiwan and the mainland, are internal matters between, like, like we said earlier, a newer government and remnants of an old regime within the same country's territory. With them, um, it just so happens that the remnants of that old regime that administer Taiwan are being used by the United States ruling class to advance its geopolitical goals. Now, in order for Taiwan to remain useful in this regard, there needs to be a certain level of stability between the mainland and Taiwan. And if instability, instability is um, provoked 
it needs to be manageable by the U.S. if the goal is to serve U.S. geopolitical interests. This is why, although the U.S. has conspired to balkanize China even before the end of the Chinese Civil War, it doesn't benefit the U.S. right now to have Taiwan declared an independent country when the aftermath of such a declaration would be unmanageable. And although the People's Government on the mainland says it will not give up the use of force to maintain China's territorial integrity, it doesn't mean that Beijing is eager to launch an attack on Taiwan or pursue reunification through non-peaceful means. I mean, ever since the 1980s, the two sides have enjoyed a mostly stable relationship with travel, trade, communications, that sort of stuff mostly normalized. So from Beijing's perspective, launching a war to complete the historical task of Chinese reunification would create a lot of problems that I would prefer not to deal with. I mean, from Beijing's perspective, it already is one country. It's just one part of the country that's not, um, it's a um, renegade province, renegade territory, and it's an internal matter for it to resolve itself. I mean, you see, you have um, renegade regions in all sorts of countries, but it just so happens that the U.S. wants to surround them, um, Eurasia, surround China, and Taiwan happens to make up a very important part of what the U.S. calls the first island chain. Are you, does China consider you a citizen of China? Can you, can you go to the mainland and travel freely? And do you have one of their passports? How does that work? We have um, what is called the travel pass for Taiwan compatriots to the mainland area. So we are, people on the Taiwan area are recognized as Chinese citizens. And they're also recognized as residents of the Taiwan area. So when we go there, we do have the same rights as Chinese citizens, as mainland Chinese citizens although it's still a little bit different. Like, um, unless you have residency there, you don't get like a residency card, which operates like a like one of their standard ID cards. But for, as far as travel goes, you go there, you go through the line for um, Chinese citizens. It's a pretty quick process. Okay, so could you move there and live there without any problem? Yes, we have the right to um, abode and live over there. We just need to renew the pass every five years. So, um, before the pass expires, we need to um, make a trip back to Taiwan or some or somewhere with um, the offices that can process this process the um, relevant paperwork, and then we can just go back. So your passport, when you travel the world, is that a Taiwanese passport or a Chinese passport? It is an alternative Chinese passport, I would say, because it wasn't until the 2000s that the word Taiwan was added in English under the passport, but in Chinese, it only says the um, the Republic of China. Now, the Republic of China and Taiwan are not necessarily one and the same. The um, mainland China does not recognize the legitimacy of the Republic of China because it sees the PRC as the successor state of it. But at the same time, the Republic of China constitution also does not see Taiwan as a country. It sees itself as, um, I mean, this formal claim is not actively pursued but it claims to be le the legitimate government of all of China with Taiwan just being part of it, a tiny part of it, I would add. Yeah, so what is the sentiment now? So I know that over the years it has shifted. Um, it, it used to be heavily the people, I don't even, well, first let me ask you, this idea of peaceful reunification. So if mm -hmm. it is, okay, we're gonna maintain the status quo until we have ultimately peaceful reunification, um, what is that supposed to look like and why hasn't it happened? I think um, if we want to think about why it hasn't happened, we have to think about how Taiwan became rich. I mean, at the end of the Second World War, it was a very poor society and its um, industrial base had been de devastated because as a Japanese colony, it was subjected to um, air raids by the Allies. Now, Taiwan became rich because it kind of got in where it fit in in the um, global value chain headed by the U.S., right? And for a while, it kind of, it worked to our benefit. We saw massive growth, especially in the 80s. There was this sort of semi-planned economy by a Bonapartist, um, Jiang Jingguo, Jiang Kai-shek's son. And things were good. So the fond memories of, you know, playing our role in the world's, in a world order dominated by the U.S. got us rich, and these sentiments are very hard to um, are very hard to erase. Now, peaceful reunification would have it's it's simple. It's the idea that whatever issues we may have with the mainland, it is an internal matter between Chinese people on the two sides of the strait, and um, that was that was 
what most people thought up until the early 2000s, but I would say in the early 2000s, um, the first DPP administration was elected, um, Chen Shui-bian. And his administration decided to um, change the curriculum that the kids here are taught. Um, you know, history classes and, you know, civics classes and stuff. They, they used to heavily emphasize our Chinese culture, our Chinese heritage, Chinese history, and really work to tie us tie our history today over here as maintain this sort of continuity with 5,000 years of Chinese culture. But that sort of ended and it's kind of implied that Chinese culture, Chinese history is like foreign history that although it's part of our roots, it's still something separate. And a new generation of, um, of people were, were raised to believe that they're not quite Chinese. And you also have Western NGOs doing their job you have the ned you know making sure that hey there is this sort of there's just enough animosity that peaceful reunification won't happen mm-hmm. now on um, peaceful reunification I, my imagination of it would be the mainland's living standards surpassing those of taiwan or becoming on par and the u.s the U.S. style of living not no longer seeming like a um, an attractive alternative, mm. and that will get people to want to um, sit down and really talk. Because I think politics ultimately are fake when you're thinking of when you're thinking about politics with your heart. It's when you're making political decisions with your stomach that they really matter. I think that you make a really good point that right now maybe Taiwan uh, wants to, you know, maybe there's this idea and maybe there's been this idea of, well, we want to be independent. We want to be more capitalist um, tied to the United States because the the standard of living is great. And it and it was for many years much better than mainland China, for sure. But as that shifts and as China rises and becomes the next global power, which I think is inevitable to replace the United States at some point um, in the near future, that then Taiwan, that the sentiment might shift and they might see the, the shiny new stuff in China and say, well, that's the that's the place now that has the golden era. You know, now they're experiencing their own golden age and have the shiny new things and the U.S. has, has got problems. And so we'd rather be closer. Yeah, so I, I could definitely see China playing the long game on that one and just saying, well, we're just going to wait you out because that's it's just a matter of time before you want to reunify with your people, right? your Chinese people, rather than these Westerners over there. Um, what What do you think China wants with Taiwan? Why is China so hell bent on the one China policy rather than saying, okay, be your own, let's let's keep friendly relations and be your own people, be your own be your own country if that's what you want. Well, I think on the whole shiny new things thing is a huge issue right now the um the conflict between the US and China is um very heavily centered on tech and as you know TSMC is based in Taiwan and there's also the matter that um Taiwan was considered by MacArthur to be an unsinkable aircraft carrier it forms um the first island chain that surrounds um the Chinese mainland with um forces that are friendly to the US so of course um, it is in um, mainland China's interest to break the silent chain and have the um, have its access to the Pacific a little bit more open. So, I mean, this goes back to um, Blinken's visit to um, to China. Why did Blinken visit? I mean, he also visited during a time when he had Bill Gates and um, you know Microsoft, Jensen Huang with him, Nvidia, and you also have top, top executives from TSMC paying a visit from Taiwan to the mainland. So, why is that? I mean. If we look at why all of a sudden now the U.S. seems so threatened by um, by China and we get into the crux of the issue, we need to talk about the chip industry and why the U.S. cares so much about it. Because I don't think it's really um, China being hell bent on on maintaining its um, or, or China being aggressive. It's more um, it's being reactive to um, provocations by the U.S. because the U.S. has agreed for so many decades that, hey, your issues with Taiwan, that's an internal matter. We do not, we're not going to um, either encourage reunification or Taiwan separatism. And I mean, the U.S.'s actions, although it's not formally um, supporting um, independence or anything, it is pushing the envelope and contributing to 
instability. So I think if we want to answer this question, we need to look at how dollar hegemony works because the U.S. dollar is backed by nothing physical. It's fiat currency. It's um only thing backing it is the faith of um the government. And I'm sure many of your um audience members understand this, but in case some don't, what this means is the U.S. the U.S. dollar maintains its value if if valuable global commodities like oil or technology are traded in U.S. dollars, and if these highly valuable and important commodities are traded in U.S. dollars, then it means international debts are also issued in U.S. dollars. And it so happens that since 1985, the U.S. became a debtor country with a trade deficit growing ever since. But because the U.S. issues the dollar, it can pay debts issued in U.S. dollars by simply printing out more money at the expense of causing um, inflation. So mm -hmm. I think a common misconception that we need to clear up is that the U.S. invaded Iraq and launched a coup in Libya to take the oil. But this is not quite accurate. Of course, it did have to do with oil, but it wasn't to just take the oil. And um, if you understand this, then you'll understand why the U.S. is um, all of a sudden viewing China as this sort of almost existential threat. The real reason was um, Iraq decided to start pricing its oil in euros, and Gaddafi wanted to start trading oil with this um, local gold-backed currency. And um, an attack on the strength of the dollar to the U.S. means an attack on U.S. hegemony and unipolarity. And right now, Taiwan-based TSMC has a 55% market for um, contract chip fabrication. And most of the advanced processors are made by TSMC. Other players in the industry include companies like Samsung and Intel. And though TSMC and South Korea Samsung are not U.S.-based, they do trade their chips in the U.S. dollar. And if um, mainland China's chip manufacturing technology gets good enough to compete directly with TSMC, you know, Samsung or Intel. And that means companies all over the world, especially in poorer countries, you know, that seek alternatives to um, TSMC, Samsung, or Intel chips, can start buying from the Chinese mainland. And you can bet that those chips will be sold in the Chinese yuan. And as most are likely aware, just a few years ago, the U.S. began sanctioning Huawei. And while Huawei did decide, did design some of their own chips, the fabrication of those chips that they designed were done by TSMC. So those sanctions kind of woke the people up on the mainland saying, hey, um, we can get cut off from the supply of chips at any time. We can design the chips, but if we cannot fabricate them, we can still be cut off. So it encouraged Chinese leadership to really begin um, ramping up research and development in its homegrown chip industry. Right now, um, TSMC is at three nanometers and Intel claims that It'll get to two nanometers by 2025. And mainland China today is at seven nanometers and it's having some trouble going further. But it claims that it'll get to five nanometers by 2025. So we can see that although they're still um, a few years behind and they may or may not surpass the US, the gap is at least closing. And I suspect that the purpose of Blinken's meeting with Chinese officials around the time of visits by you know Bill Gates, Jensen Huang, TSMC executives is basically to tell the government if you stop subsidizing your chip industry, we'll send you our second tier products at a very inflated price. We won't give you our best products, but you'll at least have something that's better than nothing. And But we'll only do this if you give up on trying to catch up. And what's truly despicable is, um, well, on the surface, it might seem that this is good for the people of Taiwan and South Korea. Reality kind of tells us otherwise, because I don't know if people are familiar with this. Um, I guess some are, some aren't. But with every new generation of chips, if you are a chip manufacturer, you have no you have no idea if your new um, process will work. You look at them, Samsung going from 10 to 7 to 5 nanometers. They went from 30% market share of logic chip um, of the logic chip market down to 15% from 2016 to 2021, while TSMC went from 50 to 75%. It's impossible for any chip company to maintain dominance forever since um with every generation, you're essentially um, you know, rolling dice with God. Now, the U.S. passed the CHIPS Act, and it's requiring companies that get U.S. subsidies to move their leading-edge production facilities to the U.S. and share production technology with the U.S. government. What this means is the U.S. government has multiple companies rolling dice with God, and as long as just one company is successful, the U.S. will have instant access to the technology, which you can probably assume it's going to share with U.S. companies like Intel. And if you look at Taiwan, our economy is growing, 
But if you remove TSMC from the picture, our economic growth is negative. It's also already uncertain how long the TSMC can maintain its dominant position in the chip industry. And the, um, the Chips Act's passage basically imposes tech transfers and it's hollowing us out. And if TSMC doesn't maintain dominance, which it never was going to maintain forever, you can bet that our economy is going to um, start sliding, start, you know, start descending. So and then that those are just some of the big factors. Right. And then that that actually might cause, especially at that point, if that is years uh, down the road, let's say 10 years, then that would potentially cause the people on the island to turn towards mainland, which is at that point potentially doing really, really well. Uh, but yes. yeah, I mean, it's a, I, that's one thing. That's one question I've always had is why doesn't China just start manufacturing its own chips? I mean, if it's, you know, and why doesn't the United States for that matter? I mean, if Taiwan is so important because of the chip manufacturing, then why doesn't everybody else catch up and start manufacturing their own chips? And it just seems like it's a matter of time by, before they do. I mean, it's the same thing with oil in yes. the United States. Rather than going around the world and trying to get oil, why don't we just get our own oil? And then the United States became more oil independent um, and not as not as dependent on on bringing in oil from you know importing it in, and you know that's just kind of inevitable I think with technology as well. So it's it's going to be interesting to see what goes on. But one final question for you, I mean, before we let you go, is really just wanting to to get the sentiment of the people in Taiwan. Would they prefer the United States to come in and actually start fighting on behalf of the island? Uh, against mainland or would they prefer or or you know what is the what is the ideal scenario for the people that you I mean I know everybody's different you can't speak for everybody but as a general rule what would you say maybe your peers that are in your age group what is their senate what are they hoping for I think what the people in Taiwan hope for is the same that most people in the world hope for which is a better future for themselves a better future for their um for their children and um increased livelihoods, living stable lives. And people intuitively know that war goes against all of this. Now, people may have different understandings of who the aggressor is in this situation, but people typically just want to avoid war, which is why um, most people just want to um, indefinitely maintain the status quo. Now, if the status quo is inevitably is um, indefinitely maintained, eventually you're going to go one way or the other. But right now, what this means is Reunification or separatism is not really a priority among Taiwanese people. Our priority is just to increase our increase the people's livelihood. Hmm. So it's more of a discussion we have over here than you guys have over there, is what you're saying. It's, I mean, it's something that's been happening. Cross strait issues have happened and have have existed in one shape or form ever since 1949. So mm -hmm. it's, um, I feel like people here are more or less numb to it. Ah, uh, got it. Okay. Um, Shang Yu, I, I wanted to play this because I just think it's so fascinating. You, you say you're a rapper, you're a anti-imperialist rapper. Um, yes. we're, we want to play a little clip of you. This is so interesting to me because you do, you're rapping in Chinese, right? Is Yes. And so we just want to play a little clip just to show which, people. Which song? I'm just, I'm just curious. Is uh, it the newest one? Oh, like as if I can pronounce this. <laughs> You're gonna ask me. It's in Chinese. I don't know what it's called. They have English the titles name. on YouTube. Um, it's the it's it's um I don't know which one it is. You could tell us once we play this one. That, that it was the enslavement of African people that gave rise to what people know as capitalism today. Was no such thing as capitalism before black people were enslaved. The reality is that when we met white people, they were poor. They were chased out of Europe by disease and poverty. They had nothing. 信息之火可以燎原，虽然革命还很遥远，资产阶级不断谣言，获众群众，搞定火种，点燃后一直抱怨，走进考验的人民不会永远这么好骗。我让你瞧见帝国主义败。Shang Yu, you're very good. It's very good. <laughs> My new stuff that's coming out is much better than that. I oh. I, I kind of look back at my old material. That stuff, I, I, that um album came out in uh twenty nineteen, and I it's, no, it's it's not. So is rap music big in Taiwan? I mean, are you are you getting gaining a big audience with this type of music? I mean, my audience has always been pretty humble. It's just been um enough that it's a hobby that pays for itself. Now, um, hip hop Chinese hip hop is becoming very big, especially after um, 2017, when there was a show on the mainland called um, Rap in China on primetime television. 
So, um, I mean, it was kind of big before, but it really blew up in 2017 on both sides of the strait. Well, you'll have to send us your new stuff when it comes out, since you, you were embarrassed by that one. Sorry about that. I thought well, yeah, it was I mean, really you good. could have you could have picked the first one on the YouTube <laughs> on the YouTube channel, the very first one on the very top, the one that played automatically. That's the newest so far. But oh, the that's newer the newest one. Is one. Out, yeah, a new a, a new um, I think the best song I've written so far, um, is the one that's coming out at the end of this month. So okay, you can stay well, next time. You're, yes. Yeah. Well, we'll we'll put the link down below to your YouTube channel. And then anybody that wants to check it out and and listen to the good stuff, the better stuff, then they can absolutely do that. But really appreciate your time. I know, um, sorry I kept you so long, but you're all the way over in Taiwan. And we don't really get very many guests that are all the way in mm -hmm. Asia because of the time difference. But because uh, I know it is tomorrow for you over there. So thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thanks for your insight and best of luck to you with uh, with your service and with um, with your music. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much for having me on.